speaker, lecturer, preacher, recorded. and workshop facilitator, and scholar. Her two books on the events in Ferguson from the perspective of activism, Ferguson and Faith, and Faith After Ferguson were featured in documentaries, uh, including uh, a PBS documentary released in 2017. She is uh, currently the Senior Vice President, Chief Mission and Values Officer at IU Health here in Indianapolis. And previous to that, she was Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean at Christian Theological Seminary. Her prophetic voice and pastoral leadership has been heard and seen all over the country, I think all over the world, and including my own congregation, Central Christian Church here in Indianapolis. So I am greatly anticipating what she has to present to us this evening. Thank you so much, Jim, and good evening, everyone. It is truly a pleasure to be with you. I am so uh, delighted to have this opportunity to share a bit with you and uh, invite you to just sit back, relax, come with open heart, mind, and spirit that together we might discern what the spirit is saying to us today. So my very dear friend, uh, Della Stanley Green, has helped to make this possible and want to give a very special shout out to her and show great appreciation. Della has been keeping me in line a long time now. And so <laughs> just her friendship and support has always meant so much. And I'm so thankful uh, for her making this connection with us tonight. One of the things that Della taught me and many people at CTS was about the practice of silence mm -hmm. and how when we truly quiet our minds, our feelings, our senses, just to be still, that God very well may speak to us and often will speak to us anew. And one time Della came to one of the classes I was teaching. And first, let me say, back in the days when I was the dean, you know, they didn't, I didn't get to teach that much because the dean's office was wild. And so I was always just doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, but every once in a while, I would get back to my love of teaching and be in the classroom with our fantastic students. And Della came and gave a presentation one time to one of our to one of my classes and introduced us. It was on reflection and vocation, the classes on vocation. And she introduced us to the practice of silence, of sitting in silence as an act of um, not only reverence, but also discernment. And it made a difference. It was just stunning how it truly made a difference. The students felt it. Um, we all experienced it collectively. And I, I have never, ever, ever forgotten that. And so one of the things that uh, has meant so much is being able to integrate that in many things that I do. Uh, I can't always do it when I'm giving public presentations, but I just felt in this particular context that it would be appropriate to do so. And here's how I'd like to approach it this evening. I just wanna take a couple of moments and first read a scripture and then have just two minutes of silence and then there is a picture I'd like for you to take a look at. It's a still photo and reflect on that. And then I'd like for us to have a little bit of conversation about it as we move into the rest of our content this evening. Hear the word of the Lord in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, the bow, and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us just have two minutes of silence, of silent reflection. Amen. Oh, just one moment as I get the photo up on the screen for us. Can everybody see this okay? Well, we also know that in the Christian faith tradition, we find ourselves 
just days into the Lenten season here in 2023. And as we have heard the word of scripture and had just a few moments of quiet reflection, I encourage you to take a look, a close look at the picture that is on the screen. I invite you to think about not only what you see, but what do these things mean? What do they represent? So we'll take just a few moments. If you would like to chime in, unmute yourself and chime in, uh, you are welcome to do that. Note what you see, but also what does this mean to you? Together we move forward. Mm -hmm. Good. Anybody else? Well, people supporting each other in community and helping each other along. Mm -hmm. And probably united in some common cause that we could see on the other side of their t-shirts. <laughs> Very possible, yes. What does this type of image and the meanings that you all have just described, what does that have to do with Lent? Do you draw any connections to the Lenten season? Well, I'll respond. Uh, Quakers aren't necessarily that into the church calendar as mm -hmm. uh, many traditions. Mm -hmm. um, Lent in Worship and Wonder, which is a, uh, a children's program similar to one, I can't remember what it's called, with the Quakers, is seen as a journey mm. towards the cross and resurrection. And so I sense the importance of community in that difficult journey. Very nice. Yes, thank you. Anybody else? They're on rough terrain. Mm. Together. Mm -hmm. And Lent can be rough terrain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is David in Ohio. I notice four different demographic categories in which there is a variation. We have black and white, we have old and young, we have people of different physical abilities, uh, and we have male and female, which immediately puts me in mind of Paul's declaration, which is the basis of much of my social ethic, that in Christ there's neither slave nor free, male or female, and on down the line, and we can add more such mm -hmm. di apparent differences, but that we are one in the spirit of the living Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you all for these, these reflections as we think about this 
image as it relates to this particular season of the journey toward uh, the cross, that of what it means anew to be one in Christ, to recognize that this journey has some rough terrain, but also that doing this together in community, in all of community, is what we believe God calls us to do and how to journey. And so it is in that spirit that I want to talk about Ferguson at the intersection of faith and justice. Ferguson at the intersection of faith and justice. Many of you may know that um, when the unfortunate time in 2014, when Michael Brown, an unarmed teenager, was killed by a Ferguson police officer, uh, I was living in St. Louis with my husband and our two sons. And I, like many, found themselves very uh, troubled, very uncertain, very curious, but also wanting to be involved in working toward acts of justice. What we saw, we believed to be unjust. And for far too many people, they had seen that kind of action happen far too many times. And that what we saw coming after that was scores of young people who said, we will not look away. We won't pretend that this is just another tragic accident or tragedy, but rather that this is a long-standing act of injustice that we can no longer continue to accept. I happen to be on research leave from Eden Seminary that um, August, that semester when it happened. And so many times I was out at the protests. I was very involved with what clergy were doing, um, keeping tabs, helping provide leadership for the Mother's March that occurred um, that, that October, because all of this went on for months and months and months. And toward the end of November, received a call from the good folks at Chalice Press, which is the publishing house for the Disciples of Christ, where they invited me to uh, write about clergy involvement in the movement for racial justice in Ferguson. Now, my immediate, immediate response was, had I known that I was going to be writing about this movement, I would have been taking pictures, taking notes, but that's not why I got involved in this important work. Uh, but nonetheless, what I also knew is how important it was to capture the stories of what I was seeing, not only what you could see readily on any of the news channels or on your social media apps, but rather what I was seeing as it related to clergy in particular, and wanted to know more about what animated them to get involved in the ways in which they were, being involved in ways that included, yes, of course, protests, um, but also providing safe sanctuary and other forms of engagement that you know, I want to, to talk a bit about. And so to have the privilege of being able to listen to the stories of some of the young people and clergy, um, about not only what they did, but how this was understood as an expression of their faith. Out of that came the first book, uh, Ferguson and Faith, Sparking Leadership and Awakening Community. And this book is, is um, one that gave, gave rise to conversations all over the place about aiding the conversation of what is the role of faith communities? How do we understand the role of faith communities and or people of faith in the work of doing justice? Shortly after all of the book was published, I moved to, I was invited to come and be the Dean at Christian Theological Seminary here in Indianapolis. So we moved to Indianapolis and just a few years later, 
the folks at Chalice Press reached back out to me and said, hey, would you be willing to write a follow-up book to Ferguson and Faith? And I'm like, okay, sure. And I started writing, but I had to stop. And this was in 2018 or so, because being a, a dean, um, being a mom of folks you probably hear in the background, <laughs> um, um, all of this, it was just a bit much to try to write in the midst of doing all those things. So I had to stop writing this second book. I had already gone back and started interviewing people from St. Louis to find out what's happened since then, but I just wasn't sure it was going to be able to happen. But then I decided in the fall of 2019, I felt the spirit leading actually, you know, it's time to pick this writing back up. And so I did just that. I said, let's just find a way to figure out how to continue this work of finding out what's happened since Ferguson and how we can um, continue the work of writing the book. And then 2020 became the apocalyptic gift that it was with the emergence of a virus, the coronavirus, with the ongoing public incidences of Black people being killed by law enforcement. We witnessed George Taylor, uh, excuse me, George Floyd being um, suffocated to death pretty much. We heard about Breonna Taylor in Kentucky who was a young woman in her apartment. Um, and the list was just going on and on. And so what I felt inclined to do was not just stop the story with the um, with Ferguson, but I ended up carrying the second book all the way through January 6, 2021, and included the insurrection that happened at the United States Capitol. So out of that book came, out of all that came faith after Ferguson, where I more explicitly focus on resilient leadership in pursuit of racial justice. Um, I never imagined pulling the narrative all the way through in that way, but I just believe God had other plans. And out of that has come not just a recounting of what happened during those times, but rather who it is that we understand ourselves to be. And in light of that, what do we feel and believe God is calling us to do in pursuit of racial justice for the purpose of building a future filled with hope. And so this is what Faith After Ferguson is about a lot. And what I wanna just spend a little bit of time tonight talking about in terms of what that means for our shared work together. In Faith After Ferguson, I um, begin the book with the then president elect standing at the microphone um, when President Biden was president elect then had not been installed, was standing at the microphone after January 6 and said, this is not who we are. We are better than this. This is not who we are. And I begin the book that way because it is my earnest belief that if in fact we are seeking to do the work of racial justice and be serious about creating a future filled with hope for all, we have to stand in our truth. And the truth is what we saw happening on January 6th was a reflection of who we are as a nation, as a country, who and where we are at this particular time 
in our shared life in history. Not naming that, not standing in that truth is not going to magically make us any better. But rather, if we're serious about that not being who we are, we have to actually take steps to make that happen. And so I go on to talk about, after pointing that out, that not only is this um, happening at um, the U.S. Capitol building where we witnessed with our own eyes people that were at the foot of the Capitol while Congress was in session, where who broke through the barrier of police officers, made it all the way to the top of the stairs, busted out windows, beating police officers with poles and flags, making their way all the way to the, the house floor, stealing classified equipment and documents. And then at one point, there were those who stopped to offer a prayer, took off their masks and hats and sat and stood as if this was an action sanctioned by God. This is all on tape. I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is, this is all on tape. We saw that, but what we didn't see was tear gas being deployed once the mob of people started making their way up the Capitol steps when the Congress was in session. We didn't see rubber bullets being shot. We didn't see um, uh, the National Guard blocking the way so that people could knock it. We didn't see any of that. But we saw that on the streets of Ferguson when people were protesting with their hands up. We saw that when people were protesting after the killing of George Floyd and the list goes on and on and on. But at this pivotal moment, when there was a threat that we had not witnessed with our own eyes, maybe not quite in our lifetime for many, there was no use of force in a way that met the moment. We have to ask ourselves, well, why not? We've watched for the past decade and previously, tear gas, bullets, rubber bullets, dogs, water hoses, you name it. But at that moment, nothing. And then when they were leaving, I recall images of people being helped down the steps, not to go into a police car to be carted away to jail, but just like it was another day of tourism at the US Capitol. So when then, President elect Biden said, you know, this is not who we are. We're better than this. This moment calls us to stand in our truth and say, no, this is who we are. It wasn't lost on me that January 6th happened on Epiphany. You may well recall that day where the baby Jesus had been born and the Magi were going to visit Jesus. And Herod had another idea for what he wanted from them and told them, oh, go find him so I can go and worship him too. But their intel helped them to know that that wasn't exactly what he wanted. And so after the Magi went and found Jesus, they had to decide to go back another way to their home country. They could not go back the same way if unless they knew they would run into Herod's posse and it would not go well for them. So they had to figure out another way to get home. I think that applies to us so well after January 6th because that watershed moment 
in this country's history, shone a bright light on the state of so much of what is happening in our country today. And if in fact, we are looking to go back from that moment to go home, we have been tasked, if we're going the way of justice and mercy and love, to go back another way, not to go back doing the same kinds of things that was on display there and the implied, the implications that came about as a result of that, but rather to go back another way. And so my response to President Biden was, yes, this is who we are. We're being called to stand in our truth about this and respond to God's call to go back home another way. Go back home to the work of building beloved community for the sake of us all. Go back to being the kind of community that does justice, loves mercy, and walks humbly with God. But to do that and achieve that, we can't go back the same way that we came in. Okay. I showed that image of the people making their way across the grass. Some, most were walking, one was rolling. As an image for us to hold in our hearts and minds about what it might mean for us collectively for the sake of us all to go back another way. Now, I don't mean that as though everywhere we'll go, we'll always be able to have a group of people kind of traveling along with us in that way, a group of diverse people, but just that image of what that picture represents of the kind of society that we can be not that we are, but that we have the potential to be. What do we believe God is requiring of us to make that happen today in 2023 in light of all that has happened? And so I, I, I believe that if we're going to do that, we have to employ more than just a cognitive awareness about issues related to race and racism in our society. In other words, we just can't say, oh, I know racism exists. It's not enough to leave this in the cognitive space. If we're going to take seriously about the ways that racism exists in our world, we have to employ all of our senses in that work. Our sense of sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. You and I have come to know the world largely through our senses. Think about it for a moment. You see a picture of um, tulips behind me. Tulips are my all time favorite flower. But would I really know much about tulips if I was never able to feel them? Would I be missing an aspect of tulips if I was not able to smell them? Would I really have a full sense perhaps of the vibrancy of their colors if I was not able to see them, would I be able to know that they too can whisper in the wind if I never listen closely to them? I didn't come to know and love tulips only because I knew that they were a flower. I came to know and love 
tulips by engaging all of my senses in seeking to learn and understand the essence of what they are. But what does this have to do with racial justice? How do I see it? How do I hear it? How do I taste it? How do I smell it? How do I touch it? Let's start with sight. I ask you this question. What do you see when you see a Black person? What do you see? Do you see a human being? Do you see a child of God? Do you see someone that is human in the same ways that you understand yourself to be human? One of the things that added to the tragedy of when Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, was when the officer went and gave testimony of his account of what happened on that fateful day. Now, mind you, the testimony didn't come immediately after the, the event, which is when I think any testimony ought to be given, but it came a month or so afterward. And during this time, the officer who was about the same height as Michael Brown, the unarmed teenager, the officer who had his gun, he said, I felt like a five-year-old boy holding on to Hulk Hogan with demon eyes. Listen to that for a moment. I felt like a five-year-old boy holding on to Hulk Hogan with demon eyes. What? Did the grand jury hear? What did they see when they heard that testimony? Did they see a teenager in the middle of a residential street with no weapon? Or did they see and imagine Hulk Hogan with demon? eyes. One of the problems that we face globally, it's not just the United States, but globally, but for the purpose of our conversation tonight, we're talking about our shared space here in this country, is all too often the imaging of Black people is one that is derogatory, is as deviant, and um, degrading as a person, as people created in the image of God. We do remember that when the US Constitution was written, Africans that had been bought enslaved to this country were then deemed three-fifths of a human being. They were not seen as human beings, but rather as property. And to then carry that forward all throughout um, hundreds of years of slavery and reconstruction and Jim Crow and all the way up through civil rights and up until this present day, the imaging far too often of Black men has been as thieves, as crooks, as deviant, as stronger than what their body shows of high tolerance of pain, of degrading images of Black women. Like we could have a whole nother session just studying these images, not only throughout history, but even in our present day. And so to bring all that history forward to that moment 
where the officer said, I felt like a five-year-old boy holding on to Hulk Holman, Hogan. He nor the grand jury in that moment saw Michael Brown as a human being created in the image of God, but rather as a beast that, quote unquote, deserved what he got. I ask the question, what do you see when you see a Black person? Next, hearing. If we're going to be serious about understanding all the ways in which racism exists in our world, we must be willing to listen to the stories and the truths of those that are disproportionately impacted by it and believe their stories, believe our stories. So very often, all my life, as a matter of fact, I have heard people say when there would be an officer involved shooting and, and the story would immediately come out that the person that was shot had a gun and people that were in the vicinity said, they didn't have a gun, there was no gun. And the retort was always, well, why would the police lie? Why would anybody lie about that? And it was not until the invention of this that we began to see another truth. My hunch is that if it were not for this, you and I probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Because the narrative would still be, well, why would, why would they lie? If that young, can you believe it was a young teenage girl who stood and videotaped George Floyd's last moments on earth? A young girl. What might the story be if we never saw that video? We've got to be willing to hear, listen to, and believe the stories. Those who have been most disaffected. We know how powerful stories are. So powerful such that there's a movement afoot across this country to ban books, any teaching about the historical facts and truth, truths about slavery, about Reconstruction, about Jim Crow, about the civil rights movement. They're banning books on Rosa Parks. Why do you think that is? If you can stop the telling of stories, the stop the believing of these truths, then you stop any movement, both now and into the future when each of us on this call are long gone. Stop the belief and believing that any of this ever even happened. Third, we have to be willing to taste the bitter dregs of discomfort. Oh, one of the things that came out of the Ferguson movement was um, a lot of churches started having sacred conversations on race. There is a fantastic organization in St. Louis, Metropolitan Churches United, that is a, a not-for-profit that works with congregations 
in myriad ways, but after Ferguson started doing work as it related to the work of, 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 of racial justice and um, attending to the ways that racism shows up in our world today. And so many congregations started having these mediated sacred conversations on race. The guidelines for these conversations included, number one, we need you to stay in the room because far too often, and I've witnessed it for myself, that when a conversation about the history of race and racism in our country, the church's role in that comes up in a group study or uh, uh, some type of, of, of workshop that Bob gets mad and folds his arms, that Sally starts crying and Jim storms out the room. Friends, that's not tasting the bitter dregs of discomfort. Seeking to dismantle racism and build a world, world that's just and equitable is not your feel good fuzzy work. Standing in the truth that this requires for this work does not leave one feeling, oh, this is so nice. We should have done this sooner. It's hard when you're working with a congregation that had to reconcile with its own legacy of denying Black people entrance into their church, that had to wrestle with its own legacy of Black people that could get in being relegated to sit in the balcony, that had to wrestle with its own legacy of when the church bell would ring after service and it was time for everyone to depart. They were not just departing to go to Piccadilly's, but rather reconcile with the fact that actually that departure would sometimes mean to the town square to witness a lynching. That's not your feel good fuzzy truth that we want one, anybody wants to have to be confronted with. But if we are to be serious about dealing with the what, the who, the how, the why of how we got here and what we need to do to forge a better way forward, we have to be willing to taste these bitter dregs of discomfort. Fourth, are we willing to be close enough to touch, to feel the light and the heat? One of the things that continues to awe me to this day about what so many congregations did in St. Louis during the Ferguson um, movements and protests, again, like I said, that went on for months and months, was they opened up their doors, some of them as safe sanctuaries. In other words, these were spaces where people could come in, they could get food, water, take a rest, they opened up their sanctuaries. If people wanted to just have a space of quiet meditation and reflection. And there was one church in particular in St. Louis, when I was talking to the pastor, she shared a story with me about how during this time, their church had decided that they were going to be a 24 hour operation of hospitality. So that whosoever would wanna come in, take a break, have a meeting, do whatever they needed. The congregants came together to support those efforts. After the protests had wind down and they were transitioning that effort into, into some other kinds of things, a young activist came to the pastor and said, 
here, Pastor Jackie, here's, here's some money. And Pastor was bewildered. She said, what, what's this for? I, I don't want any money. And the young lady said, but why are your doors open to us? And that just broke my heart wide open. Because what the pastor said this young lady went on to say was for so long, she had never felt welcome inside of a church. She, she had some tattoos and perhaps was same gender loving and just the way she dressed or the way she went about, she was not made to feel welcome. And so she had never in her young life mm, 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 encountered a church that was willing to get close enough to her to touch, to open their hearts and arms and truly welcome her without wanting anything in return. This same church, this same pastor, one day was out marching in the streets with the young people. They were marching up Grand Boulevard and had a few other pastors with them. Now, this cohort of pastors were um, maybe a bit on the, the upper side of the age spectrum, and but out with the young people and walking. And there was this one um, older African-American pastor who was with them also marching. And one of the things that happens with protests is sometimes when people are chanting, the language that they use not always be pleasing to the ears of everybody. In other words, sometimes curse words are used. And so this is a, um, this was a time where they were marching, they're marching and, you know, they're, they're saying, you know, what do we want? Justice. When do we want it now? Or the whole blank system is guilty as blank. I'll spare you the curse words. Um, you know, they're marching and saying these things. Nobody's violent. Nobody's inciting violence. They're just, that's their march. That's their, their bantering. Well, this group of pastors is Walk marching with them, and the young people start saying these chants and saying some colorful language. And the older Black pastor said to them, Language, language. But then, in that same breath, he turned to the pastor of the church and said, But the young people have done it. They're the ones that are leading the way. So, in other words, he wasn't pointing the finger saying, you young people stop that bad language kind of thing, but rather in a more grandfatherly kind of way, like, oh, language, but he's out there close enough to touch and marching with them. What's the point? The point isn't that you have to be in a protest to be close enough to touch, but are you willing to get close enough to where hurt happens most among people who have been hurt the most, close enough to touch. Finally, if we're gonna be serious about building a future filled with hope, we have to move beyond the cognitive stance and employ all of our, sis, our senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and also smell. Friends, if it doesn't pass the sniff test, don't be so quick to buy into it. You know, every once in a while, I'll walk into my house and go, what's that smell? And you go try to get to the bottom of it. You go over to the trash can. No, that's not it. You go looking around some of the corners. No, that's not it. Then you go into one of the rooms that, oh, look at here. Somebody had food in the room and put it under the bed. Hmm, look at that. In other words, 
when something just doesn't smell right, don't be so quick to let it go. Don't be so quick to just excuse it away and say, oh, my sense must be extra, my sense of smell must be extra sensitive today. We've heard about um, microaggressions that can easily happen in the workplace that aren't your brazen calling somebody a bad name or making an explicit um, off-putting joke that's not very funny at all. But the microaggression, when qualified people are passed over for promotions or um, the hiring manager is looking at resumes and intentionally doesn't even try to pronounce someone's name correctly, let alone try to give that person a fair shake for consideration for employment. And the list goes on and on and on. And very often these and so many other things can happen where to the untrained sniffer might just seem like, oh, no big deal. But for those who have been impacted, know immediately what's going on. So I encourage you that you don't lose your sense of smell in the work of racial justice because Racial injustice or racism doesn't always show up with a hood and a burning cross. It shows up oftentimes like an odorless gas where you don't even immediately know it's operating until the carbon monoxide detector either goes off or people start passing out, metaphorically speaking. So please don't lose your sense of smell. So we employ all of this. This We bring our full selves into this work as we circle back and think about that image that we saw early on and working to build a future filled with hope so that our children and our children's children can live into that type of world, we must commit to act. A-C-T, act. Number one, we must commit to accept that the way things are, are not the way things have to be. In other words, human hands have created this. This is not God ordained, human hands have created systemic racism, not God. And since human hands created it, human hands can recreate it, except that the way things are, are not the way things have to be. Second, we must commit to employing all of our senses in the work of pursuing racial justice. Not just saying, oh yeah, I know it's a problem but really seeking to understand all of the ways in which it is a problem and commit to working to build a just and equitable world. And finally, T, trust. We have to trust God as people of faith. We trust God to believe that the world that we are seeking to create, that the seeds of justice that we are trying to plant, that they will produce a harvest for the people that come after us. We have to trust that even though we may not live to see the harvest, we trust and believe by faith that our efforts, no matter how small they may feel, are continuing and joining a broader movement of God's transforming of the world. And we believe that it shall come to pass. We trust God. 
So let us march on till victory is won. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leah, for this challenging, evocative message. I'd like us to just pause for a moment, absorb it, and let people collect their thoughts for questions. And if you can, please use the raise hand function so we can more easily spot you. But let's pause for a moment to hear it again. So friends, what questions, reactions, comments do you have for Dr. Gunning Francis? Well, I'll take the I'll take the advantage of having a moment. I'm 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 so profoundly moved by your full embodied message that we have to be there with our whole selves. And having just taught a class on trauma and the including how racial trauma is generational for people of color and impacts whites and other privileged persons, that trauma must be addressed in a full body way because it is in our blood, in our, in our very DNA in essence. And so your 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 use of that language is 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 so profound for me having just taught that class and 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 clearly uh, it, it is part of you as well it is thank you for that um it is you know we from my perspective um you know discrimination of any form and to include racism it disembodies us from ourselves. And if we are to live as the whole people of God, as full people that we, you know, and, and definitely in talking about trauma as, as you have, you know, we have to understand the ways in which it, 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 it is down to the cellular level in so many ways and to work through that and through the healing process, we have to bring bring our full selves to bear in that. And so the work of healing, the work of building, the work of community is embodied work, not the disembodiedness of dehumanization, but the coming together of that is fully human. So thank you for that. Juliana. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you so much for the talk. I was really struck by your use of we language. And in a time when we are so polarized, it stands out because it would be really easy to say those people of January 6th, those people, and how you talked about our legacy, like those historical people. Um, how do you think about challenging people? It seems that was really intentional and you can correct me if I'm wrong. How do you 
think about challenging people to lean into we being we and not an us and them. Yeah, thank you for that. That is that is so important and very intentional. I mean, the first chapter of um, Faith After Ferguson is titled, This Is Us. And I start with that simply to, to point out that you know, this us them really is an artificial barrier. It's, it's a social construct, right? If in fact you fundamentally believe that we are all human, no, we don't all look alike, we don't all think alike, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, we are all here occupying this space together at the same time. So this is us. Um, and I think the only way to really challenge that is to keep saying that to keep correcting that. When you hear that, them and us, ba 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 ba. No, this is us. I, we in this room may have a difference of opinion, perspective, et cetera, but we should never lose sight of the fact that this is all of us together because um, even if we're not working together or moving together in the same direction, uh, to keep the integrity of, of what, what we say we believe about building God's beloved kingdom. Kingdom, as Dorothy Sole says, nobody's left out of that. Like not nobody, nobody. So we just have to keep, we have to, we have to be intentional with our language. And let me just say this one other thing really quickly. That does not absolve any of us from accountability, right? It's not any, it's not a kumbaya we. <laughs> but regardless, it's still we and us. Others have, yes, Jim, I see your hand. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really moved by um, those, well, many parts of your presentation, but the ones I want to highlight are the um, accompaniment in the marches by clergy and the radical hospitality, um, even to the point where people who had never felt comfortable in a church felt welcome. And um, that being said, one of the things that's notable about the Black Lives Matter movement of the last, um, I don't know, it's almost uh, a, a decade now, is that it's a youth-led movement with only very limited um, presence by um, clergy who, who in, in earlier movements often black clergy were a, a very large presence in the black freedom struggle. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on, um, you could reflect on that um, presence in Ferguson and absence in other places and, and not just black clergy, but, but, but um, people of faith in um, the what are sometimes called the leaderless youth-led um, protest movements of the last decade, including Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's it. There are some stark differences and similarities from as we think about um, clergy involvement, young people involvement in both the civil rights movements of the '50s and '60s, and um, the more recent movements for racial justice to Black Lives Matter and others over the past decade or so. Uh, 
I was glad to see clergy start to come along, even though it seemed to take a minute um, when this happened in Ferguson. Uh, there were some clergy that came out, I, I'm, I saw it for myself, who, you know, were kind of rolling through and like, you, you people need to go home, that kind of thing, had the Bibles out, you know, get out the streets, all this sort of thing. But there were many other clergy that started to come and say, no, we're actually going to use our bodies as shields, um, that we're going to use our authority. The whole purpose of coming out to these places as a clergy person in clergy, clergy garb with collars or stoles or whatever indicators that you have is to show that, you know, that not only am I here as Leah, but I'm here authorized by the church and also as an extension of what I understand to be the call of God. Um, I'm just glad to see that there were more that kind of came in as time went on. And then later around the country in different movements, we saw more of that pick up. But here's where I see a lot of similarities to the civil, civil rights movements. There were a lot of young people that you know wore shirts saying, this isn't your grandmother's civil rights movement, blah, 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 blah. And I'd sometimes have to hold to put my finger and say, well, actually it is. In other words, if it were not for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Committee, the Freedom Riders, like who do you think those people are? Like 18 year olds, 19 year olds. If it was not for the Children's March in Birmingham, um, not exactly sure where we'll be. So it's not necessarily new that young people have taken the lead in, in this work. Uh, and then more and more clergy, obviously with Dr. King and so many others having a very prominent role uh, in the civil rights movement. But to, to not discount the, 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 the ways in which young people through sit-ins, all kinds of ways, college students, oh my gosh, from the civil rights movement all the way through today have really been instrumental and impactful in that. But my hope and prayer is, uh, Jim, that we're at a point where it's, it's not taking clergy as long to respond now, right? Um, and why is it, do we feel like we don't need to engage? Are we still buying into, oh, this isn't the work of the church. I don't have anything to do with this. This isn't my community, et cetera. Um, but how do we really fold this into uh, our lives of faith as, as, as leaders in the church. Other comments, questions? Well, I'll ask one more. So much of what you do described was, oh, I will stop. Helene, go ahead. Thank you. I like to hope that we're on the same wavelength and that whatever it is I say will fit with whatever you say. Uh, I feel a gatheredness in this uh, in this space and a lot of commonalities. Um, I wonder uh, what is our view of God um, in that we have underneath uh, these observations and what leads us to, to the call to follow God or to allow ourselves to be led. Um, sometimes uh, we don't open ourselves to a new vision of God that may be calling to us. Uh, I feel something very new um, in the world and in our speaker this evening, some points of, of um, openness. It's not the same old thing. 
I love the old things. I love the traditions. I love the way I was brought up and the faith that I have gained through the years. But I'm wondering what is our most um, current emerging sense of the nature of the one who is calling us, whom we call God. That's a profound question, Helene, that I think is definitely worthy of, of some uh, group reflection and engagement about, because it is that very image and understanding in real time that often determines how we live out our faith in the world today, right? Like you say, we have our historical formation and things that we've maybe understood or to be about God, but what does that mean today? Like that would be a very profound question to wrestle with. And out of that wrestling, where does that lead us in today's world? I'll add to that, that um, I have felt that black, uh, the black church, black Christians within all of Christianity are taking the lead now in saying no to some outmoded views of God and of Christ. And um, the idea of suffering being necessary um, or accepted as Jesus on the cross and we're on the cross with him and it's somehow ordained by God and, and we just have to take it for granted. I hear people saying, no, this is not my Jesus. This is not my God. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, no, I'm saying that we matter. I'm saying I'm not going to take for granted the idea that, well, this is just part of what life is in this country. We've always been this way. We have to put up with it. I, I, and I'm shocked at how pervasive it is to still keep saying that we have to put up with it. And yet your whole talk is, no, don't put up with it. So this is saying that we have to be open to re-examine re the old hymns, the old passages, uh, the old psalms, the old everything, so that something new comes out. And I hear you saying you were surprised at things that you saw that you hadn't expected. So is this the God of surprises that has grabbed you? And are you surprising us uh, and, and fellow Christians with you, surprising us with your surprises? <laughs> I think that is so. Yes, uh, I continue to be surprised in in all kinds of ways. And how do we maintain that posture, right? To be open to the ways in which God will surprise us, which means that what we thought we knew may not be all there is to know. I love it. Thank you. I have to write that down. What we thought we knew may not be all that there is to know. Man, who said that? Oh. <laughs> yes, April. I, uh, <clears throat> I apologize for the screen off. I um, have a horrible cold and oh. uh, blood red eyes and a blood red nose. So I'll try to get through this without sneezing. Um, but the last comments, I believe was Helene and Dr. Gunning Francis made, I am so hopeful um, because what I was struck by in the beginning of the presentation was the comment that the clergy came alongside. Mm. And I think that for those of us who might be a little older, we need to learn to come alongside and listen to the God that is being revealed to us. Um, and there, I've been in a lot of situations where 
we think we have so much wisdom to give that we take over and um, squelch that of God that is arising. So I, your choice of words I found was quite telling, not that the clergy came out to lead, but came out to be alongside and came out to open the doors for hospitality. Thank you for that. That was a critical piece um, in this movement as it relates to the church. I'm not saying that the movement wouldn't have continued without the clergy, but that was so critical because, you know, for the reasons we'd already stated about people not feeling welcome, but also for clergy to embody the practice of humility, right? And to do that on full display for others to see in a sincere and very meaningful way. Many would often come and apologize and say, you know, no, we haven't been here for you. We haven't stood up long before Michael Brown was killed or so many others. Like it, there've been enough things to happen that clergy could have been doing a lot more before that. And so to come with that, come alongside with that spirit of humility and apology and seeking to genuinely reconcile um, was just so, so powerful to me. Yes, Chris. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Gunning Francis. Really, really appreciate all that you've shared with us. Last um, fall, maybe it was, we had a spirituality conference and one of our uh, teaching faculty, Michael Burkle, uh, gave a talk about um, spiritual hospitality. Hmm. And that's been, that phrase has been living with me this year. He talked about <clears throat> in hospitality, uh, you have the surprise and the beauty of learning from each other. So whether you're the guest or the host, you're learning from each other. And, um, and that's the great joy of, of hospitality generally. And so I, I love that idea of not only opening a, a door to a building, but really opening one's heart to learning about each other. Can you speak to that in your story of hospitality? Yeah, I, I think that that deeply resonates with me because even though it shows up in the physical act of you know opening a door or giving food, that kind of thing, but it's so much more than that. You know, it really is an openness of spirit, an openness of posture and disposition, um, an openness of, of heart to um, genuinely not only receive, but to hopefully be received by the other, right? Because it's a mutual, it, there's mutuality in that. Anytime genuine hospitality occurs, even if I'm the one kind of quote unquote hosting whatever's going on, if there's not, you know, if it's not done in the kind of way that makes space for genuine, you know, sort of give and receive of the other and each other, um, that that is just the powerful kind of spiritual hospitality that exists. Hospitality is never um, one dimensional or you know moving in just one direction. It's always bi directional. If it's truly you know that kind of spiritual hospitality, that I think you're talking about, and that I believe is where transformation can happen. Anyone else?
Well, thank you again for educating us about spiritual practices we need for this Lenten season of activism and hospitality and accompaniment and inspiring us with stories and vision and images. It has been so rich and grateful. Della, I think you have an announcement and then we'll check to make sure there's no more other announcements. I do, Leah, it is such a joy to be with you, first of all, I just have to say that. I, I, I miss being with you more often. <laughs> Friends, I want to let you know there will be an opportunity on Thursday, March 16th, to have a follow-up conversation about um, the Wilson Lectures. Whether you got to one of these or two or three or four, um, this will be particularly for leaders and friends meetings, but others are welcome to join so that we can really begin to process some of the challenges and encouragement that we've heard. Um, and I carefully wrote down, oh dear, where did she go? Han Hannah, was it? Question, um, because I think that will be one of the questions that we, we look at. So I encourage you to do that. You can register on, on the uh, Quaker Leadership Center web, web page, and that's at esr.erlum.edu um, backslash QLC backslash again. And I will put that in the chat. So I hope you will take the opportunity to do that. I think it will be a rich conversation, and it will be an opportunity for us to not just say, oh, those were nice Wilson lectures, but to say, and what difference does this make for our meetings, for our own lives? So thank you. Bella, what time is that present? Is that going to be? It will be just like just like these, six, six to eight. Brown, are there any other announcements or matters for us? Uh, no, thank you, Jim. Thank you for doing this. I think uh, this has been rich and thank you all for coming. Um, maybe just ask you, Jim, if you would offer a closing prayer. Certainly. Holy God, in our journey, our journey towards the cross, our journey towards justice, the difficult journey of accompanying suffering and hope, we know that you are the ever-present help who accompanies us, and we are grateful. Help us to stand in our truth with our whole selves. Help us to be able to discern what you require of us to create, to co-create the world that you envision for us. A kingdom where all, all are loved, all are welcome, all are your children. Give us strength in this holy, holy venture. I pray in Jesus' name.